time with your lights, unless you've invented a new plane that should be transport. If you have invented a new plane, please let someone know. Please don't do it for about um, three o'clock, otherwise the review's going to disappear. Okay. Um, in terms of flight conditions for tomorrow, it is going to be strong. Uh, to start with, the wind is dropping away through the course of the morning um, and it should be coming to the west and down the runway. Generally, the belief is that they will clear everybody tomorrow by the east weather, and we can't be 100% certain. We will have the option of at least one other uh, friend of the trust willing to do a few additional flights if we find that people stuck. So we'll be doing our best to, to make sure everybody gets off as scheduled or slightly later. If in the last break you want to warn us if you've got very tight connections, um, then please feel free. Otherwise, uh, I'm just going to go back into there. <laughs> Denial. Thank you. Right, well, uh, we're a little bit behind schedule, we're not too bad. Um, the second session is the role of marine protected areas within islands and securing marine biodiversity. And I've uh, got first with you here, Dr. Bryce uh, Stewart, who is a lecturer in marine ecosystem management here at the University of York. The central thread of his research is how to get an increased understanding of the factors regulating marine populations and communities so as to ensure their sustained utilization. Right. Okay. Thanks, George. Right, well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me here. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Um, and I've been really inspired by all the talks over the last few days. So I'm going to try and be a little bit more optimistic, maybe, today, uh, and look at marine protected areas as actually islands within, within islands, as was mentioned by one of the other speakers, and actually as islands of hope, so hence the hashtag ocean optimism. As for being more scholarly, you'll have to wait until the end to be, uh, for that to be revealed. So we've, we've heard this, Tony stole my thunder along with a few other people's probably. Islands are both uniquely diverse, a lot of endemic um, and fascinating uh, species exist on them, but of course they also borne the brunt of human uh, uh, caused extinction. Now the only thing I can do is update the figure from 700 to 800 known species that have gone extinct. Um, since records have really been kept well since about 1500. But that, of course, is much less than probably has gone extinct. There's lots of ones that we don't know about, like all the insects, unfortunately, George sort of that. And the reason for this, uh, as again, as we've heard, is this sort of the unique characteristics that you often find on island species, high endemism, um, small population sizes, vulnerable traits, etc., etc. So that's the slightly depressing bit. But I'm also going to look at islands as actually unique opportunities for conservation, particularly marine conservation. And really my talk today will be about two case studies, the Isle of Man and the Isle of Arran. And these are places I've worked myself uh, since I came to the UK about uh, 20 years ago. Now some people might recognise this view um, as being from the Port Erin Marine Laboratory. Sadly, that has gone extinct. But what hasn't gone extinct is the Port Erin Marine Protected Area, which is in that photo. And as for the Isle of Arran, that's a bit of a more recent story. But in both cases, I, um, funny enough, I have these photos in my catalogue. Well, I just put them up as nice pictures of both islands. And I realised the one we had a life ring and the other a lifeboat. And I think it's quite appropriate for seeing marine protected areas as you know, rescue missions basically in these areas where there are threats to biodiversity. So moving on to the Isle of Man first. Um, the Isle of Man in, in fisheries terms is uh, quite well known for its scallops. Uh, in fact, the Max Queenies have a um, protected identity, apparently, even though the, the populations themselves are not doing great. But here we have the Isle of Man, a little of the Irish Sea. Many people are probably familiar with it flag here, uh, and all these pink areas around here are scallop fishing grounds and scallop dredging grounds. So you can imagine it's pretty highly disturbed by scallop dredging. And this has been going on, it's actually really the place where scallop <coughs> dredging uh, was invented in uh, 1937 and then spread out from there around the UK. The fishery appears sustainable, but it depends on how you define sustainability. If you just call it 
relatively level and it's sustainable, but actually it's at a very low level compared to what it used to be. So some would say bumping along the bottom, um, but unfortunately we don't really know what the baseline is. What we do know is that dredging for scallops has really affected the biodiversity and the habitat complexity on these fishing grounds. Because it's an area that's been well studied because of that marine laboratory, it's been there for 100 years, or was still there, but just not operational. Um, we do have historical records of marine biodiversity on these grounds, and we know it's dramatically changed because of this scallop dredging. So back in 1989, and this was 10 years before I came, one of the first um, marine protected areas in the British Isles was set up, which is this area down here, the Port Erin closed area. And that's what I'm really going to talk to you about today, is like what happened from 1989 uh, to the current. So, whoops. In terms of scholars, now lots of things have happened, obviously not just with scholars, but also with the biodiversity in general. But this tells a really quite powerful story, I think. So 1989, here's scallops in the um, densities in the fishing ground and in the sort of control area next door, which is an area still intensively fish. And we did these dive surveys every summer. And what you can basically see is actually for about the first 10 years, nothing much happened. There wasn't much recovery. There wasn't a significant difference between the two areas. I arrived in 1999 and my, my boss at the time, Andy Brand, said, oh, we've got this marine protected area, it's a great opportunity for research. And he said, yeah, I wouldn't call it really a protected area, just maybe a slightly less fished area. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, it's illegally dredged all the time. And uh, he said, it'd be good if you could sort that out. <laughs> well, that's not easy. Um, it took me a few years, but about here, was when I started working with the fishermen. So Jim's going to talk more about the importance of that. But after a few years, um, getting engaged with local like fishermen, they started to actually respect the marine protected area, and you can see what actually happened. You have this dramatic recovery. So 10 times as many scallops in the protected area as in the fishing area next door. Uh, a couple of years after this data set finished, um, after the extinction of the marine laboratory, Bowman University did some drop down video camera surveys and just to sort of highlight continued high density, so growth and recovery of this population. But the density is only one part of the story. The scallops in the area are also much bigger. So these are actually based on the sort of average size and abundance uh, about halfway through that data set, but it, it illustrates the point. Because scallops uh, have grown as they grow exponentially in size as the scallop itself gets bigger, you can multiply the effect of that extra density of scallops. And we actually calculated that in terms of um, egg production, it was about 33 times greater in that protected area. But it gets even better. Scallops are broadcast spawners, so they actually rely on being near each other to successfully fertilize. So when they're close to each other in high densities, and we did some mapping on the seabed of how close they were, um, and we put that into a model, and it turns out that in combination of density, the big size, and the increased fertilization means that the production of young scallops was about 100 times greater per unit area in that marine protected area as it would be outside on the fishing ground. So this is pretty extraordinary, and this was the message I was able to, you know, continue to feed back to the fishermen, who fortunately bought it, um, because the evidence was there that catch rates around the fishing ground were going up higher and higher. Bang University also did some hydrodynamic modelling of um, what happened when those scalps in that protected area uh, spawned, and basically where the dark colours are is where the larvae are ending up. And again, um, this actually reflects where the highest catch rates for scallops were as well. So it's very hard to prove these sorts of links, but when you put all of this evidence together, it's quite convincing. In terms of the, um, the actual effect on the fishery, basically what we have here is catch rates um, on the grounds on the east coast of the island, which is, is a separate um, hydrodynamically, so not probably affected by the closed area. 
But the catch rates on the on the fishing grounds near the Prince area actually continuing to go up, and this is this has been continuing on since then. So that was when I left this story, but actually since then this has been used as a very powerful argument for more protected areas um, around the Isle of Man. And in fact, it now really I would say is the the, the marine protected area capital of the British Isles. And so you can see we have marine nature reserves all inside the three mile zone. We have these controlled fishery zones out here. And it really is an amazingly you know, sophisticated management system that really all began from that original small scale experiment that's now sort of produced this quite model system. They're so proud of it, they actually have an MPA beer over there. So that's something to inspire. Well, I think it means marine protected area. <laughs> so moving on to the Isle of Arran, and this is where I sort of moved to after I left the Isle of Man. Um, I, I'm based at the University of York, but I do a lot of field work on the Isle of Arran. And uh, I first met these two chaps, Howard Wood and John McNeish, back in about 2004. Now, Howard is a gardener, John's an engineer, um, but they're both scuba divers and they're both local residents on the Isle of Arran, and they had seen the degradation of, of their local marine environment and wanted to do something about it. And, and you know, I think they'd be, they'd be okay with me saying this. When I met them in 2004, they had a lot of enthusiasm, but not such a great idea about how to sort of direct it. But with both their enthusiasm, their learning, and a lot of help from a lot of people, they became the Community of Aaron Seabird Trust. Well, that was already there, but their, their campaign became successful. Um, and it ended up with the first no take zone in, uh, in Scotland in 2008, which is this area here in Ramash Bay. Um, and it really was years of campaigning that sort of brought this being. But in particular, what was important was the community support that led to that happening. Um, and again, uniquely, this is an area that's designed to benefit both fisheries and conservation. In the words of uh, my favourite Aussie uh, musician, Paul Kelly, who probably none of you have heard of, from little things, big things grow. So here's, you know, these sort of middle aged sculptures back here in the sort of uh, early 2000s, standing around in some random village hall trying to convince three or four people that this would be a good idea. But it moved on and on from there. So they, they moved their public campaign out uh, and got more and more people and it snowballed um, into eventually in 2008. This is uh, Richard Lockhead, the Scottish um, Fisheries Minister at the time, declaring that the area was being protected. Here is when we started doing the surveys of the Isle of, uh, of this Lemash Bay protected area, and then it was uh, moved from there into this much bigger marine protected area. And just last year, they opened this quite large and fantastic marine education centre as well. So they've gone off in all sorts of directions. But yeah, what was significant was this little red area here is the original no take zone. And from the early work, um, they campaigning for that, but also the research and the, the evidence that built up from that, they were successful in campaigning for this much bigger marine protected area. Um, it's 280 kilometers squared. It uh, bans salt dredging throughout that area. There's some trawling allowed on the outskirts for prawns. Um, and there's a couple of seagrass and little areas here as well where there's basically no um, commercial activity allowed either. So, you know, from this small beginning, um, really things have, uh, have, have come into something much larger. So as I said, we started monitoring this area in 2010. Um, Lee Howard was uh, my master's student at the moment, went in to do a PhD there. And this is where we were at the end of last year. So combination of Lee and many other MSc students, about a dozen or more, um, you know, lots of facts and figures here, but to highlight some of them, and perhaps some of the more interesting ones, increased cold cover of oil, uh, macroalgae sponges, and general biodiversity has gone up about 50% during the first sort of four or five years of protection. Um, increased numbers of lobsters, sizes of lobsters and scallops, etc. 
And so it's all looking pretty good. The, the story is complicated though, and this is important to sort of mention with, with the lobster example. So the top graphs are the lobster numbers over time or the catch in effort. The dark um, lines are in the no-take zone, and then this is the sort of nearby control area. So you can see, particularly for legal sized lobsters, the catch rates are much, much higher in there. But for these other species like brown crabs and velvet crabs, there's no significant difference. So you could say the no-take zone hasn't worked for those species. But you can also see, say that what we're seeing here is a return to a more natural ecosystem, a rewilding, if you like. Um, because it seems like the lobsters are competitively dominant over those other crustacean species. And so it's, it's really important to get this sort of data so that you know actually what is natural because there are so few natural areas out there. Just this year, so to update, hot off the press, um, we repeated the data surveys for the first time in six years, uh, funding being the issue, as is often the case. Uh, but uh, my master's student here, Lauren James, who claims to be as enthusiastic about scallops as me, which is quite something, um, she was the one who really focused on the scallop surveys. So you can see in the no-take zone, the scallop uh, uh, and the control area, there wasn't much recovery for the first few years, and there wasn't a huge difference in terms of numbers. There was in size, but not numbers. But this year, what we've seen is this spectacular increase, both inside and outside, now, this is because A, the no-take zone is still protected, and B, the other one, they've stopped dredging it as well. So we've got a situation where there's been like, uh, say, you know, three to four-fold increase over time in the densities of King's Phillips um, in these two areas. And we actually add, we had to make a new series of sites this um this year in, the, in an area that was open to dredging because our area that was previously our controlled dredged area is now protected. So we, we had a look at some survey areas further to the, um, the north and we again found, as you might expect, much lower densities of scallops um, in that area that's open to dredging. So lots of positive results here. So, are islands actually islands of opportunity for marine conservation? Well, if you look at a lot of the um, successful marine conservation stories around the UK, Lundy Island, Isle of Arran, um, <clears throat> Isle of Man, as I said, they're all islands. So it's actually provided an opportunity to do this kind of work in places where maybe you couldn't do it otherwise. Some of the reasons why I think this has happened is because of things like the strong sense of community and identity that you often find in island communities, and I've seen it, you know, absolutely to the fore over the last few days. Uh, I think what you have on islands is often species uh, that are biologically marketable. So I was going to mention the blonde hedgehog here, but I thought Rob would probably throw something at me. So just a, maybe a better example is, is the Isle of um, Aaron success story was used by Greenpeace in their global campaign for more marine reserves. And connected to that was a petition, which is now being signed by three million people. So this tiny little island that started off with a couple of guys just who wanted to do something about their local environment has actually you know, led to this global recognition. Um, Howard himself won the Goldman Environmental Prize. He's been awarded an OBE, and their success continues to grow. But of course there are challenges as well, and again, I probably don't need to tell you people about these, and we can maybe discuss some of these in the questions. Um, but definitely lack of resources, isolation, etc. Um, external influences, both climate change, but often, again, as you probably know, other fishing boats coming from outside, not necessarily respecting the local rules, can also be a challenge. So thanks for listening. A couple of I could thank hundreds of people who've helped with this work, to be honest, at making all this happen, but a few people in particular. And in terms of being more scholar, well, this is the message, something maybe to take home from the conference. If anyone knows how to get this into the House of Commons, I think we might find a solution, but we shall see. Thank you very much.
principal specialist, and they love acronyms. Three letter acronyms. Or NPH, PMCS, okay, which is Marine Protected Areas for the Marine Conservation Society. Don't look. I know we I know we're push for time, but I've got to tell an anecdote about Bryce. He's Australian and I'm French and English. And I was in his flat in York about two years ago. And I don't know if anyone likes cricket, but he went to the loo and Chris Broad got two wickets of the Australian batsman out in a in a wonderful period of my life. That <laughs> five minutes I'll never forget because his face when he came out of the bog was have any more gone? <laughs> so I've known Bryce for a long time. Uh, and I'm going to just follow on from his research. Maybe I a segue from Bryce, no, you never know. But uh, I, I wanted to my work is sort of UK policy wide, and I try and pick up the pieces of the sort of research that I've done in places like Ireland to make a bigger case. And I've done that through working with lawyers, frankly, with client Earth. That's what's been the most successful thing in the UK. But I want to sort of re-emphasize Bryce's last slide and say the commonalities we see within Ireland and well-studied and well-supported islands. Lundy, we didn't mention Scola Island, which is uh, in southwest Pembrokeshire, which has been a marine reserve in effect since 1991, close to Scola here since 1991, and of course Aaron. Now they all have commonality. They're generally old, and peer-reviewed papers say MPAs are old, generally work better. There we go, 2014. The defined areas. Islands are defined areas by by their very uh, nature of their boundaries. That allows for particular parts or all of the islands to be considered and easily recognised for particular bays or locations to be protected. And those bays and locations are known by everyone on the island, particularly the smaller islands like this one. People will know exactly what you're talking about when you say about the north side and a particular bay and the south side. The, the influence of local teams. Usually NGOs start the ball rolling, or civil society groups, but then governments sometimes take, take the, the ball by the horns. Indeed, SCOBA, which is not mentioned, is run by a, an NRW team. And they don't get much airplay or press because they're a government team. They feel reticent to sort of espouse the benefits of these protected areas publicly. So sometimes you have to be a bit more sophisticated about supporting governments in their work and, and shouting for them. You have to think about that. As Bryce alluded to, these are places because they tend to be small units of ecological scale where we can look at studying things feasibly. Studying the entire network of the UK marine reserves or protected areas is just unfeasible. So we have to use islands of ecological space to make cases for other areas. Um, Long-term commitment and funding, and also an involvement with the, usually the low-impact fishing sector. Usually they are advocates for these areas, because initially these areas tend to be areas where we try and take the mobile gear out. I mean, that's fundamental to protecting the seabed. And that can, if you're in a very, if you're in a good space, that can divide the fishing industry. So when Lundy, when uh, Lamlash went from one small site to what was actually 29 protected areas around the entirety of Scotland, there was a really good campaign by the, the creeding population to sort of side with the MPA side and to show the Scottish ministers actually there were fishermen who were supportive of MPAs and fishermen who thought MPAs were a bad idea, which were the children and dredgers. It is now becoming more nuanced and we are becoming more sophisticated about understanding who is friends to MPAs and who is not. And then the scaling up is apparent. Islands have other start. If, if there was an MPA here, it would start something a bit more sophisticated. It broke the back. It, it was the thin end of the wedge in Africa. It's undoubtable that that was the okay. case. And there's nothing wrong with that. So now we have this amazing scale of the percentage of the UK sea that's gone up in MPA. And these were, that's Lundy, 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 Lundy. Scoma, 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 Scoma. And then a few SACs come in with the European Commission. Thank goodness for that. We've had a really wonderful presentation about the Isle of Wight last year. Further MPAs from the European Commission, uh, from the Habitat Strategy, were set up. Then the first MCZs. Then, uh, then we got the Scottish Nature Conservation MPAs. A further tranche of MCZs. A further tranche of MCZs. And now we are one of the world leaders in the area of sea protected. And this is the scale of the MPA network in the United Kingdom. So that's the kind of scale I try and work with. Be they huge offshore sites for harbour corpus, but almost everything else is an MPA for Benthic. Features. So designation, you could say, is easy and politically expedient. At the moment, you know, we are we are trying to make 
biodiversity in a political sense, uh, a highlighted area of work and something we want to protect. There has been this entry into parks being on land for, air, for a long period. We've had the blue planet effect, which has been really effective at ratcheting up the scale of concern for the marine environment. Plastics has been a great vehicle for our other project areas in our organisation to pull along with. Um, we understand the issues of overfishing. Every year we hear about the uh, change of scientific advice in December at the European Commission over quota. Um, and that has led to this groundswell of public opinion on designation. But the management is difficult, and that's where I tended to come in. I try and deal with management when, uh, when, when we uh, have seen difficulties with the. Uh, <coughs> go back. Yeah, so. The problem that we have with management in many marine ecosystems is that the intervention by human activity was over 50 years ago. Scott judging was invented in the 1970s with, with, the, the, uh, with the dredge that is currently used. So this is before most sophisticated assessment of what the seabed was like. So the evidence requirement for intervention tends to be really quite high. It's very difficult to get the evidence in the marine environment. And there is little money for management and regulation relative to the scale of that matter of the route that there is have. And of course there are market conditions which lead to fishing activities encroaching into the usual environment. So this is a plot of the intensity of fishing activity in the mid, the, the 1990s to 2007, and you can see there was a movement inshore. Lime Bay is um, to the north, um, here. And then I worked in Falmouth. Uh, in around 2007, 2008. This place was being scallop dredged, but was not a protected area. This place was being scallop dredged, it was a protected area. So with Bryce's help at the time, when I was working um, on, on Falmouth, and Falmouth is where my heritage is. It's quite interesting to understand about one's heritage. My grandfather was harbour master in Falmouth. So now I'm one of his arch enemies, or I would have been. Um, and uh, you see, that, that's also very important in understanding why we have motivations to do the work we do, but I understood a bit that Thalma. So I worked on Thalma, and the Wildlife Trust worked on Lion Bay. And it, it took a long time to deal with Lion Bay, but this place was a special area of conservation. And we started telling journalists like Charles Bowe about issues like this that were happening all over the coast. And Sam Blanfield showed these exact images, I think, of what was happening in Lion Bay. Um, but the same thing was happening in Falmouth over Merle, which Bryce has shown with his research, is really good for scallop spat nursery habitat. So the fishermen were actually um, decreasing their own value of their own fishery. Um, here's some of his work which says this complex habitat, oops, sorry, oh, the wrong button. Yeah. yeah, there we go. This complex habitat appears to positively encourage spat settlement in the area. <coughs> so um, we told Charles Clover about it, because Charles Clover. Well, before he wrote End of the Line, he was the environment editor for the Telegraph, and he was really rather well connected to the British government. And he started making press statements about it. There was a local campaigner who wanted to stop the scholar dredging in the site. Um, and that, the site was eventually protected from scholar dredging in 2008. Ratcheting up of the concern of scholar dredging led to closures in the inshore environment of Wales in one fell swoop with a scholar board in 2010. Probably the most radical fisheries management measure politically in the United Kingdom at the time. But was it radical? It was ra It was not that radical because in the inshore fleet of the Welsh inshore environment, no one scholar dredged. The scholar dredges were from here, 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 and here. So it was to the interest politically of the, the MPs to actually protect these sites. So 15,000 square kilometers of seabed was protected in one fell swoop. But these are really important things, and they come from places like Arran and the Isle of Man. The research there showed we shouldn't be salt dredging inshore in these initial environments. When all these case studies filled it together, I realized that these people are going to change the earth more than these people. Because these people provide you with clear arguments that say, this is yes or no, you, you do, will deal with this. So we started working with Client Earth in about 2008 to try and build the case from Falmouth up into all of the special areas of protected conservation in the United Kingdom. Um, and we started to work uh, in terms of challenging the right to fish in effect, and that there was no right to fish in special areas of conservation, and that there is a presumption that there is damage that has to be disproven in the habitat regulations, as many of you know. So we published various papers on this and um, briefings, uh, and it led, led in 2012 to a 
a complete change in policy and government that was proactive over these activities in all sites um, in 2012. Uh, an implementation group was set up which uh, was science-based but also had all sorts of individual stakeholders involved in government. Um, we reviewed a gear damage matrix, you heard this last year in this presentation, um, and there were clear roles of regulators. Um, there was a staged period of actually protecting the environment with the most highly damaged, uh, highly vulnerable habitats protected first and others afterwards. And then the offshore measures, which is still to be introduced, which might be a benefit from leaving, from leaving the Euro European Union, is that we still are seeing, uh, still are seeing massive delays and watering down of management measures for the minute you go outside six nautical miles. That's the political reason. And this work was done in order to be legally compliant with the directive to meet international targets on MPAs and MPA management. So the designation is easy, this stuff hard, this stuff costs, but this stuff is what makes the MPAs worthwhile. You can have island MPAs at the scale of these places which work, but when you build up networks you need some of this top down stuff. You can't just deal with it on a localised basis, you can't expect it to, be to occur. So here's an example of the matrix which probably goes way out to sea in terms of its scale, if you were to scale up the entirety of this document, but I can send it to you if you're interested in it. I have sent it to various people, just like Francis in the party, who well aware of this work. And the Ithacus, the regulators all over the United Kingdom had to implement this within their own catchments for each individual MPA. And the exciting thing about this, this is, which is why I was quite optimistic about its, its long-term impact, is it is being transposed into other MPA regulations. So it's not just European law that this applies to, it's now applying to other domestic types of reproductive area. My work now is looking at the sort of secondary communities that might be considered to be able to be damaged are around the core high-risk zones. But in some places like the Southern Isle of Wight, gentleman was speaking about the Isle of Wight Biosphere Reserve, you've got, got one of the best protected sediment beds in the entirety of the UK. Um, so I second your uh, Biosphere Reserve for the management that, that your local regulators put into those areas. It's, uh, it's very exciting. But many other Ithacus don't find this measure something that is politically expedient, or perhaps the advice from Natural England is more equivocal about the potential damage to this site from tow gear, these sorts of habitats from tow gear. And that's where we have some difference of opinion with regulators and natural owner, where there are these emergent species that will accrue through thin sediment veneer, which would create richer habitats. Scallop beds around the edge of Scoma Island Marine Reserve, they themselves are so dense, they become a habitat of themselves when I've died there. There are so many scallops, they are just like hard ground themselves with all sorts of bivalve and crustaceans and and algae within them. It is amazing what the marine ecosystem could do if we stopped the trawling, yeah. frankly. Um, so what was the impact of the island science going towards a national policy of protecting areas from dredging and scalloping? In the southwest, it was quite, quite progressive with these black areas around the site protected. I talked about whales where scalloping was spread. But the more sedimentary areas in the North Sea and particularly the offshore sites have not seen much protection at all. The protection measures in the wash are just those dots over there, which are absolutely protected. And um, they have been increased to a much larger area in the wash, but the shrimp trawl fishing industry is being protected by being allowed to tow inshore in the, in the wash SEC, to our great reluctance. But there you go, that's, uh, that's the politics of life. Uh, Scottish has followed, Scotland has followed suit with not just Aaron's enclosed areas, where are we down here? But many, many other sites. I think there were 19 high risk inshore sites that were protected in 2015. Um, but the, when, when there is a funding gap, the role of civil society is huge. We need good governance buy in. Um, and sometimes NGOs can help with providing partnership work to make NPA management resilient. Uh, collaboration is key. Here's a site. Um, just south of Devon and Cornwall, which is called the Edstone Reef, you've probably sailed past it, some of you. We have an experiment where we're looking at closed areas with the Ithaca and working with the University of Exeter as well. So it's a collaborative project where the strength of our individual components is better than us individually. 
and we're seeing recovery in some of the zones uh, inside the protected area. You will, you probably know about sea search. Sea search is being used and continues to be used with a slightly different balance of its role now to look at what MPAs are doing now that they've been established. This is the influence of sea search around the United Kingdom since it was founded. Um, we can look at distributions of key species such as pink sea fans and see that how they're distributed in relation to MPAs and also in relation to where the closed areas are. So we did a publication with the University of Mexico to, dis to show the distribution of known pink sea fan colonies and the protection of those colonies, which is quite encouraging. But then there are always other threats in MPAs. It's never an enemy beast. There's the manacles, uh, a wonderful part, part of the world for biodiversity. That was threatened by a, a potential development of a quarry. Um, that was seen off because the actual cost of development of the quarry was probably too high for the developer at the time. But Sea Search provided much greater assessment of data and resolution than the original camera surveys by the, by the consultants. We provided all this data close to, to actually where the quarry would have been occurring. So <coughs> MPAs are live. They are live things. They don't just stop. We need to keep um, the pressure on individual individual MPAs to see what we're going to do. I've been talking to colleagues about this community voice method. Some MPAs will require, such as this one in Sussex, uh, Kingmere and Beachy Head West, um, they require sophisticated communication tools with stakeholders who might be skeptical about MPAs. So we developed um, a methodology called the community voice method. Andy Sangera, who's in the audience, who now works as our a Caribbean MPA officer. He used this initially in Turks and Caicos Islands to involve fishermen in developing new legislation for turbo fishery. And that was ratified by the fishermen and the government. And we decided to use this back home in the United Kingdom, where we thought that the regulators were going to have trouble in developing bylaws to protect their marine protected areas. Lots of people in the UK don't know what marine protectors are for, why they're there. This tool which films members of the community and plays that film back to them allows for that skepticism over measures to be deflated in meetings because individuals who you see represented in, in meetings are represented on film. So it's a way of getting good representation of community and a bylaw has been passed through. I've got one more slide. Okay. Um, and then what we need to do also is show where these activities are occurring. So we developed tools uh, which show where the trawling is happening or continues to be allowed to occur. This is called the MPA Reality Check, a website I developed in the United Kingdom. Um, and just to say also, we're developing projects on eco moorings in seagrass beds with these piles which are pushed into the seabed, which have very small footprint, but have a torsion strength that can be monitored at nine tons pulling strength and we actually keep the riser chains off the seabed with these boys. These are all in marine protected areas. The developments of these measures in collaboration in this sense with Natural England allow us to go forward. So my conclusions are, sorry if you go on a bit, um, we've gone from three marine nature reserves when Bryce turned up in the United Kingdom. It's all his fault. So about 350 marine protected areas of some kind, covering 25% of our seas, that's to be lauded. Um, we're slowly managing our seas in MPA's feature by feature. We've seen a lot of fisheries bylaws in MPA's, protecting well over 50 <coughs> English and Scottish MPA's from trawling and dredging. But, but, we need to rewild or see recovery and not conservation for wider ecosystems. Recovery has to be the key rather than protecting what we've got. That is my take home message for what MPA should deliver. The islands of help. Thank you very much. So without further ado, and without having any introduction at all, I'm sorry, Byron Makeda is the Executive Director of the Women National Trust. Over to you. Thank you. We've got time We spoke this morning about wearing glasses. So, whoops. So we're at the top of the um, Leeward Island chain. Um, and well, it is windswept, flat, um, and small. It's only 91 square kilometers. But because we're at the top of the iron chain, we actually have a really wide and substantive um, economic exclusive zone. So it's 85,500 square kilometers. 
It was known for its white sand beaches and turquoise waters. Um, so most of the activities, um, and they were established by the government of Angola between two, 1993 and 2007. Fortunately, most of these sites are paper parks. They lacked um, a clearly identified management body, management plans, enforcement. And some of these problems um, are based in um, limited resources, of course, but also limited processes for engaging stakeholders um, in management. In 2016, the Department of Fisheries and Marine Resources completed a marine product systems plan, and the government of Angola accepted the plan along with legislative recommendations um, and also agreed to best management of these products to the department. Um, so three years later, we're still waiting for those amendments to go through the House of Assembly, but we didn't want to continue just waiting on government to make these things official. So Department of Fisheries and National Trust um, started to discuss about how we can just start to move that process forward on our own. Uh, we install mooring buoys, maintain the buoys. They do research and um, monitoring, but there isn't a lot of management of actual activities that are happening in these mountains. So we started discussing about how we can actually make this more effective. And we decided that we need to take a more holistic approach to marine heart management. Um, holistic in terms of what's being there. Most of the land that borders these marine parks are privately owned. Mm -hmm. So we have to deal with not only activities that are happening in the water, but we also need to be engaging and working with stakeholders who are on the land who can influence and affect the quality and integrity of our sites. But we also needed to be realistic. Department of Fisheries and the National Trust are small organizations. We have limited resources. Um, and so we decided that we would need to combine our efforts. And instead of tackling everything at once, we would focus on one marine park and show that we can effectively manage that site before we expand further. So we decided to start with the Perfect Care Marine Park. So Perfect Care covers an overall islands. It's Perfect Pair East, I mean, seabirds on Perfect Pair East and West. And um, this includes a globally important population of red bull tropic bird. And as Louise mentioned, we recently um, began reintroducing critically endangered lesser and different iguana onto the Lake Parrot East, creating an iguana sanctuary there. And we have three different species of sea turtles that use the beaches as nesting habitat. So we have leatherback, screens, and topsails. So both the marine and terrestrial biodiversity is quite important. So much so that the entire area has been identified as a key biodiversity area. There are two restaurants on Privilege Pair East, and they're visited by Angolians as well as by people from neighboring islands. There's charter boats from St. Barth's and St. Martin that visit um, Privilege Pair at least once a week during the high season, which goes from about November to March. So we're getting thousands of people coming to um, the island monthly. And um, we spoke to the landowners, and they actually really supported what we were proposing, which was working together to um, use Prickly Pear Marine Park as an example of how marine parks can benefit both nature and people. So in 2016, we successfully applied for funding from Darwin Plus, and we launched a three-year project in 20, April 2017. <coughs> So the purpose of the project is to effectively and sustainably manage Prickly Pear Marine Park with a collaborative and integrated approach. It's collaborative in the sense that it includes government and non-government agencies, the private sector, including landowners, and it's integrated in the sense that um, management wouldn't just be confined to the water, it would also include the land. There's four main components to the project, um, identifying biodiversity value in water and on land, creating a effective and sustainable management structures and tools, implementing on the ground priority conservation actions, and then finally developing our own capacity to plan, manage, and monitor the park and the keys. <coughs> so between February and April 2018, a mission plan for the marine park was developed by representatives from the Department of Environment and Forest Board. And that would implement the management actions within the management plan and also monitor success. So some of the management actions that we have at the park um, we're also in the process of installing mooring buoys 
as well as marine park boundary markers. Um, we created habitat for seabirds through the construction of um, artificial nesting houses. We removed the rats from the keys. And as mentioned earlier, we reintroduced the native group in the endangered iguana. We're in the process of establishing a hiking boat association with the Nicole Trail using lobster houses as the main feature for that trail. And that will be within the replenishment zone. So anything that occurs within this trail, whatever it attracts, will be protected. So we're especially pleased with that um, all of these stakeholders want to work together. We're also really happy that they want to be involved in the management of Angola's six other marine parks. So on the agenda now is the um, creation of the uh, management plan for the Little Bay Marine Park. And that's going to happen starting in October. And then we'll be moving on to the Sumbaro Island Marine Park and Nature Reserve next summer. So we're really excited about other things for a commitment by UKOT governments to protect at least 30% of their, their waters. And they actually just recently announced um, that they'll be putting an additional 7 million pounds into that initiative. And we're struggling with underfunded and under-resourced agencies. We can expand it into the open ocean. There's lots of pelagics and, and migratory species that definitely do need our help. But should we be setting our target at 30% coverage? Is this the best way or can we have both? Regardless of the answers to any of these questions. So this leads to the next question of is there room outside of the marine park network for sustainable management of habitats and species? And I think there absolutely has to be. But any sort of national plan or national initiative also needs to be resourced. Um, we also need to understand our biodiversity and the UK's biodiversity. We need to invest in management and enforcement and in developing relationships and structures like that we haven't run out of time to make plans. The last call for the second session is Jim. How long does it come to get to add? Jim Mandel, you have five minutes. No, they did. I'm sure we can overrun it a little bit into lunch. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. yeah. Good. Um, I have come down with the Bristol cold, which has sort of wiped out whole swathes of the southwest of England. And uh, so, yeah, apologies if I'm a bit stuffed up. Um, okay, I'm going to sort of skip through um, the first part of my talk, but basically what, what I'm going to be talking to you today about is about the need to build common ground and the, and the, the role that trust plays and building trust plays in supporting um, co-management type approaches where people are collaborating and work together. Um, and, uh, and what us as an organization are doing to invest in the education of fishermen specifically, but you can apply this kind of thinking to terrestrial as well as fishing. So it's not sort of unique to the fishing industry. Everything. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about fairness and fisheries management, balancing needs between the ecosystem and, and human needs and being both part of the same system, a bit about what is co-management barriers to collaboration and that education for co-management itself. So fishing can sometimes be termed a sunset industry. Failures in fisheries management have led to sort of plummeting resources, plummeting returns from those resources and profitability, um, increasingly widespread damage of the marine environment, and basically sort of like a loose-loose situation where fishermen can end up feeling like or being a bit of a, a, an endangered species. But there is a realization that those stakeholders play an important part in that, that system and also within the systems that they operate in the coastal community. So there needs to be a way of resolving these competing demands. <coughs> the constraints of the needs of the environment and humans must be met, understood, and balanced. And it's sort of towards an, like something called an ecosystems approach to management that, 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 that philosophically people are heading towards. That does make a lot of assumptions about the capacity of people to actually participate in those processes. So what is co-management? Co-management is essentially a problem-solving process between industry and government. They both have a really important role to play. It requires um, a process of negotiation, dialogue, combined sort of co-learning, and it also operates at different scales. So some of the challenges in this are that collaborative science and integrating knowledge from both the, the sort of the um, less formal fisheries science from the fishermen themselves into the formal fishery science of the fishery scientists and managers. Leadership education to support that collaboration in the first place. Policy innovation, making sure that the policies are there, which people have spoken about as well today, so to support these processes. 
But I'm not sure if you said this, but it's very hard to be green when you're in the red. And this is sort of an often used sort of a trope, if you like, about sort of old the hardship for fishermen, but it, it, but it is a reality. When you're trying to put bread on the table for your family, it can be a real barrier to you even contemplating changing what you do, even though it might be in your very best interest to take a more long-term perspective. So this is a real this is a real barrier here. And this is where we sort of come in. This is where we've chosen to intervene as a charity. These two guys, Mark Robson and son Paul, um, Mark's a trustee of Fishing Into the Future. This is his quote, 34 years as a fisherman, I've never, never been taught how science interacts with the fisheries and management. He's never understood why there is need to, whether there needs to be fisheries management, fisheries science. How does it work? What is it, what are they measuring? What are they counting? And how does that then impact the fishing opportunity that he has? So imagine being in their shoes. What drives them to go fishing? What must frustrate them to be as fishermen who maybe sort of don't have a voice in the way their fisheries are managed? What's it like being in their shoes? And actually sort of taking that and thinking, let's come at it from a different angle. Um, so education for co-management. Fishing is really complex. There are complex interactions between people and there are complicated interactions between policy and science, etc. So this is a landscape that fishermen need to navigate really well to be successful. But fishing is a very practical activity. Practical knowledge is very highly valued in the fishing industry. Academic knowledge, not so much so, and actually it's, it's an industry typified by low levels of educational attainment and literacy and stuff like that. Big generalized, big sweeping generalizations, but generally that's the that's picture. Um, and how are you going to communicate with people when they're not necessarily, you don't share a common language? So um, this is a quote from a guy called Carlo Ryan. You might, you might have heard of Carl, he's a chief scientist for DEFRA and works in CFAS. He came to one of the events that we run where he found that he felt he'd changed from thinking that sharing was not about sharing data. He came at this as a scientist thinking, I want to share data with fishermen. I want their data and I want to use it. He went away thinking it was more about sharing himself and his personality and his, his desire to find a common ground with those fishermen that really changed the way he felt he wanted to work. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to build a common understanding. What's happening here is... This is a survey planning activity where we're getting, giving fishermen the opportunity to think like scientists. Rather than trying to catch everything, they're trying to see if they can count everything and be accurate. And obviously, the sort of natural competitiveness of fishermen, they, they, they were sort of competing against each other, et cetera, et cetera. I can't go in, I don't have time to go into the exercise, but it's a practical exercise in flipping the coin and getting them to think as scientists. Um, this is Lexa Dayton here. She comes from the Gulf of Maine Research Institute in America, and the model we're using has been imported from there. And this is it in a nutshell. Fishermen are trained to catch fish. Scientists are trained to measure and save fish. There needs to be some form of education to help people work together. What we do is we bring people together and we, we convene leading fishery scientists and managers with sort of progressive thinking fishermen. We kettle them essentially for three days in, in a really pleasant setting where they're well looked after, there's a good bar, there's good food, and we fire at them, some of them sort of like hardcore fishery science and management for three days, and they have to take sips from this hose of information that's coming at them. Um, but that's the, that's the kind of the, the transferred information, if you like, but the important part is breaking bread together. Give fishermen the tools that they need to navigate these systems and to talk within these collaborative dialogue sort of frameworks, because with that, their voices aren't necessarily here. Um, but it costs money. Breaking bread together, I'm sure Roman will attest to this, breaking bread together, socialising, networking is incredibly valuable, but it takes time and it takes money and it takes an investment. We're sort of bridging that investment gap by doing what we're doing. Um, and finally, just, I like this picture of this guy, I'm not sure who he is, um, wonderful photographer, Joanne Coates works for us. But imagine a world where the relationships that need to underpin MPA management and, and all the collaborations that we've heard about today are supported through an educational process that, that, that allows people to have this common level playing field. And then imagine a world where that doesn't happen and the kind of conflicts that will arise. And I think, as, as my question to you is, what could you do when the areas that you manage and the places you manage, what could you be doing to the better support the people who operate within those systems to help them participate in the management process and to feel that their voice has been heard and that hopefully a sort of more sustainable and long-term vision of the future will evolve. And that's all I'm going to say. Reed is a very important point about making vision and think like scientists. 
and making scientists think like visionaries. I know the importance of walking a mile in someone else's shoes, uh, I don't think you can underestimate that. Well, I'd now like to call on the executive director of the UK Overseas Therapy Conservation Forum, Dr. Catherine Winsink, who's going to sum up conclusions uh, from this morning's talks. Catherine, you can do it. Well, yeah, you, you certainly can, and you may want that as well. Yeah. Uh, no. um, thank you for elevating me to uh, Fox status. <laughs> oh, well, I, I, I award it to you now. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay, I'm going to be chairing the stream as well, because I've, I've just um, I've got 10 conclusions. Um, well, in a conclusion, but 10 points just to kind of summarize the morning. Um, so, Islands are unique, they're arcs of biodiversity, and they're vulnerable, but they do offer unique opportunities for conservation. We can turn things around. All is not lost. Rewilding is possible, um, be it a small scale or a large scale or somewhere in between. We need to be prepared to take tough decisions and make investments take precautions and um, sea level rise is coming. So, you know, any of you think about that there. Um, will we see the first non-human climate change refugee in Anguilla? I thought that was really, really interesting. And um, you know, a warning to the all. We have a bigger voice together. We need to lobby and influence policy makers. Um, and we will feel the impacts harder and faster on islands. Um, marine protected area designation is easy. They work, but they need to be well managed and realistic. Civil society groups can help governments shout about the successes. Um, we, you know, work with an NGO in the area have quite a hoarse uh, voice sometimes about all the shouting. Um, islands can help us make the case for protecting larger areas. When there's a funding gap, the role of civil society is huge. The partnerships and collaboration enable us to do more and to expand our reach. These partnerships and sharing of knowledge applies to landowners as well, um, but also, crucially, resource users. Networking takes time, it's not cheap, but it allows us to move forward with work we all need to do. So, that was my conclusion. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we have time now. I would remind you that the third session begins at two o'clock. And that's what role should NGOs and government play in response to climate change and biodiversity loss across our islands? Mm -hmm. Roland? Yes, it's, oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. <coughs> but, yeah, but before we leave for lunch, we have got what an hour for questions and answers. So if I could have the speakers from this session back on the, on the stage, <laughs> you can fire away. To your heart's content. Nobody wants this today. Right. Let me take that out of your body. Right. We got the rolling microphone. We have. Have we got the first question? We have. Um, yeah, I was just interested, particularly when I mentioned my last talk around this issue of being at the point where we should just ban big fluorine across the British Isles, or is there, is there some sort of compromise? Is there a ratio between high areas, green set areas, and, and, and fish sites that include big fluorine, or, or is it just simple to say we should switch to other fishing techniques? Do you want to ask me? Well, I'm interested. From all of you, but I mean, I'm interested in how that marries into these techniques about bringing the fishermen on site. Because, I mean, my experience of Yorkshire East Coast fishermen is that 
they're not entirely receptive to that kind of thing. Yeah, the, the, I mean, there's a the whole conversation about where those cultural sort of barriers come from, how to overcome them. Um, the issue of gear type and deployment, I think we have to accept that seafood represents a significant part of our protein opportunity. It can be very low carbon um, generating. Um, it, therefore, if it's managed well, it can represent a very good sustainable source of, of protein and food security. But it needs to be deployed in the right places and in the right ways. And I think it is, yeah, it's, it's like it needs to be married well to the seabed type. So in areas where the seabed is, is in danger of significant damage, then I think absolutely it needs to not happen in those areas. Um, but where there is um, more mobile settlements that maybe have um, a more perturbed generally anyway, I think that's more acceptable. But it's a societal choice. I mean, that's, that's the point is that we as society, we choose to eat that seafood, we need to understand that that has implications. So in some ways, you're, if you choose to not eat meat or, or any sort of meat protein, you're then transferring the impact you have onto soil production, farm or whatever it is. You need to understand and choose those impacts. So I think they need to be moderated through really effective management. And that's why fishermen understanding the impact that they might be having and thinking about their long-term future rather than that, an immediate harvest sort of a mining effect of those resources um, is, is a I'm not saying it's a golden silver, but I think it's an important part of it. Add to that. So yeah, this might this might seem surprising from somebody who spent 20 years studying the effects of solar energy, but I absolutely think there's a place for it. It does provide a source of food and income. Um, and there are places, a number of places where there have been studies that haven't been able to show any effect on it. And then, as you said, they're often those highly naturally disturbed mobile sediment areas. But of course, there's lots of places where it shouldn't occur. And it still occurs in too many places. And we have lost a lot of habitat, some that we will never get back, but some that can recover quite spectacularly. So I actually really like the model that they use off the Yorkshire coast. Where what they've done is they've designated a spot dredging area or two of them rather than having everywhere open to scholar dredging except the bits that are closed they've, they've you know they've turned it around and they've said okay this area um, it has scallops in that particular the case they they worked with the static fishermen they said okay it's not really an area that's used that much for the static fishermen it doesn't seem to be any particular habitat species of conservation concern Will designate this as a scholar dredging area. It's very tightly controlled, permit system. I know you probably know this wrong, but I'm telling you what it was. Uh, permit system, um, you know, all the boats have to agree to fish by certain rules. They're tracked every couple of minutes, I think, they have their positions reported. Um, and those guys are making a lot of money, actually, and they're doing really well. And the, the conflicts, both with the environment and, and the other fishermen, have been absolutely minimized. Another question is how you decide who gets the permit to fish in those areas, but that's above my pay grade, I think. <laughs> yeah, I'll leave that to others. But you know, there are solutions out there. That's the important thing to, to remember. Yeah, only 5% of MPAs are protected from trawling and dredging. That's a travesty. Yeah. That's, that's what, why we did MPA reality check. So we need to massively progress this agenda. And then I think MPAs are starting bells, blocks, and we can introduce measures that Bryce talks about. But you know, we've got tiny islands of potential recovery. We need to massively expand that. So it's, 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 if five percent of MPAs are protected from gold dredging, what does MPA mean? Exactly. Uh, they mean they're feature by feature measures. So if a feature to be protected is a pink sea fan. You protect the pink sea fan in that wide area. That's what that's what's wrong with our MPS. That's the UK. That's domestic waters. So in Scotland, they ran a very successful campaign, which actually meant their MPAs are better protected than the English ones, which was called "Don't take the P out of MPAs." Yeah, that's great. Brilliant catch line. But actually, what it meant is "Don't take the protection out of them." So if you don't, if you're not banning solar dredging in the marine picture, what what how are you protecting? Yeah. It, it, you know, it's ridiculous. A question over at the 
experience with marine protection areas, and you've seen a lot of islands. Do any of the islands and places you've been to still pour raw sewage into the sea? Uh, yeah, the Maldives, where I work sometimes, yeah, yeah. there's a lot of raw sewage going into the sea. There's also a large yachting community for boats, and they'll be dumping. Never and, uh, the old man used to, and funnily enough, the, the sewage used to go into the coast area. Um, that may help you, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know that was talked about a years ago now, at least. Um, so, yeah, but, uh, yeah. I think I, I work in the same shelves as a cousin member, so they're all into you. Does the sewage harm an MPA? I think so. I mean, it depends what the feature is you're meant to protect. So, for example, there's an MPA in the solar, and the oysters that the Blue Marine Foundation were trying to grow all died in a pollution event. So, yeah, there are MPAs that are harmed by current water quality issues in the United Kingdom still, even though we've invested massively in our water treatment works. Storm sewage overflow is still a massive issue. Uh, downstream close to water catchments around uh, estuaries should be cleaned up, farming practices should be cleaned up in those MPA areas. But uh, it's not perfect, but it's better than it was 20 years ago. Thanks to Europe. Europe. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks to Europe, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we have the work to do. Uh, any more questions? Yes? Roland. So where's the new right? You're just going to summarise one place each of you. What do you think is the new right? On jurisdiction, on site, what would it be? I can't really hear the question. Can you, is, that, is, that work, is that working? That mic? Yeah. 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 Who, is, who is getting it in mics right now? Which jurisdiction or what site? What's the goal? The goal we get to right now? That's a good question. How long? Still getting it right. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really hard question. No one is perfectly. I mean, the Great Barrier Reef, you know. The most incredible network of marine protected areas 33% highly protected. Uh, climate change comes and kills half the corals in one, one summer, you know, and you've just lost all that biodiversity that, that has taken decades of campaigning and legislation to build up. So, yeah, there are these big outside influences on the Isle of Arran. You know, the, there's a great local community, there's a great Sort of network now protected areas, but there's a lot of resistance from the fishermen off island, and that tension is not going away. And you know, I managed to work with the scholar judges on the Isle of Man, and you know, we, we got them on side and we worked with them and we designed the system that was there on Aaron. I don't know, I just they're different people, and they don't want to, yeah, they don't want to collaborate with us. It's Scottish, like they're Scottish, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm, you know, Bryce Stewart. Bryce like was mentioning the Isle of Man when he started doing that stuff, and now it's got 50% of its area close mm -hmm. to tow gear. We've moved beyond MPX, and that's what we should do, like the gentleman asked earlier about beam, beam trawling. Sussex, Ithaca, the entire Sussex being considered for closure to tow gear, regardless of tech areas or not. Because there are so many ecosystem services that have been trashed for wider fisheries and climate carbon capture and so forth. We've destroyed the kelp beds down there. They need to come back. So I think things are moving, but it's perfect. Oh dear, isn't anybody doing it right? <laughs> One question at the window, yes. Um, thinking about smaller island carbon in the UK scale, um, would you? So there's more value in islands looking to get uh, a small nuclear zone or a bigger overdredging and trawling zone. Um, is it is it better to have something that's absolutely pure and can go back to what was what was once said before, or have a have a management for a whole zone? Personally, the latter. Stop the trawling and dredging. That will have ninety percent of the community recover in the marine environment compared to a no-take zone, which is a square kilometre, where you have outside influences really affecting that person. Yeah, I mean, that's the problem. So with the, um, the Lamlash Bay no-take zone, it's, it's been great for 
stuff that doesn't really move. But for the fish, like we see a lot of juvenile um, fish recruitment in there, but there's no effect on adult fish or even on like the, the brown crabs, they're too mobile. So they, you know, they might spend some time in there, but then they go, they're moving out and they're being caught or whatever. So yeah, if you had to choose, I would go for the, you know, the bigger. But hopefully, you know, good to have a small no-take zone if possible in the bigger area. Yeah. I'm going to play that as advocate here. I think um, that you can turn that, you can try to turn in that with Ted, and you have to think about fishing is the most damaging on marine activity in any certain way you can that. Um, should it be ambition be to have, as Bryce was mentioning, fishing areas? At the moment, marine planning doesn't have a fishing layer in it. Okay, So there is no, you have people whose livelihoods dependent on this. And they don't see themselves reflected in the maps that they use to, to, to navigate their industry. Okay. Now, I don't know about you, but if I see a, if I see a private keep outside, it's a red rag to the floor, I'm just going to go in there because I'm like, right, okay. you know, all the focus is on marine protected areas. It's very, it's very inward looking. It's very elitist. The language is very, is very conservative. And it doesn't include people. It doesn't open people. It's not open to people. If you look, if you take the focus and be the out again, it's okay. Let's just ignore that area that we're gonna we're gonna sort of like restrict access to. And we want to manage this wider area. What how can we can we draw a fishing box? Can we say that's a fishing ground? You manage it, you go ahead, you, you, you crack on and, and manage it together. Um one of the one of the activities we have is it's called Let's Go Fishing. We have we chuck a load of beans on a piece of paper, you draw an island in the middle, say, right, there, there you go, five fishing around the outside, ready, steady, go fish. And, and instantly all the fish go. Next time around we go, okay, let's put some management restrictions in here. You get twice as much money for fish in the second year than you do in the first year. Still, people fish it out completely. Once you start actually saying, right, you need to cooperate with the person next to you and agree your harvest strategy, and you draw start drawing the lines about whose box is where, people actually end up starting managing it together and going, so we're going to leave these fish in the sea because I'm not competing against you. I'm not managing to you. So there's loads of other ways of thinking about this that doesn't require all the focus to be on the marine protected area. Look at the wider area itself. So. Interesting. Um, one last question. I think we've got if you there with a green eye. Yes. Very good uh, presentation. Uh, Barry, just a quick question about the British government's role in the protected areas of Sinan I mean the was the 30 by 30 aspiration maybe overly ambitious? Do you think there's, is there more that the British government could be doing to elevate, move from that to like 1%? And if so, what kind of support do you think would be welcome and helpful on that? Karen Weller. So, Emma Sinan, Sinan environment has been devolved to the local government. So, while the university's territory and while people may think that these territories get a lot of funding and support from the state government, they actually don't, especially when it comes to things like the environment. So we have access to like Darwin Quest, but we're competing with all of the rest for a very small chunk of money. They also think that Angola is a very rich island and it has touristy and, and it's high-end tourism, but it's very, it's actually not very rich. It doesn't have a lot of resources. It's been devastated for a year and a half. It's only starting to recover now. So we did receive grants for restoration and rebuilding, but that's going toward physical rebuilding. It's not going into the softer strategies of how do we prevent like what the morning's presentations were about is building resiliency, but building natural resiliency. And so that type of support would be really helpful. But I know that they put in, I think, what, 20,000 or 20 million pounds to begin with, and then another seven into the blue belt. But there's a time constraint on that. And so what happens, you make all these commitments and you say, yes, this is great. But if you don't have a structure in place to deal with that after, then it just falls to pieces. And then you've wasted all of that money, all of that effort. We have to build sustainability in all of this. So if the UK government is calling our UK OT biodiversity, UK biodiversity, then they need to invest in that as well. Well, thank you very much.
run.